You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied by an adult. Hi there, and welcome everyone to the Sonic Society, the world's largest showcase of modern audio drama. I'm Jack Ward, rushing about with a pile of wrapping paper and gifts this morning, here with my co-host, David Ault. What? Uh, Jack, uh, uh, hang on, I'm used to you being four hours behind, not ten days ahead. <laughs> Is it Christmas in Halifax already? <laughs> well, as you and the audience may remember, we have early Ward Christmas every year. Right here with my parents and my sisters and all the Asundry families, they, we all come together and swap stories and presents. This year, it's actually a lot later than we normally have, and despite that, they well, they aren't quite wrapped. But in fact, I have two big ones over there for the society today. Ah, yes, I can see them clearly. The largest being The Rise of King Asylus, Part 1, and a lovely episode from your three stories. I can always lend a hand wrapping the others while we begin. Oh, thank you so much. The faster I get these wrapped, the better chance I won't be late. So we should open the first one to get us started with the rise of King Asylus, because it all begins right here on the Sonic Society. New Kingdom Radio Theater. The Rise of King Asylus is brought to you by the J.V. Micah Publishing Company, publishers of the Blake's Secret Short Reader Series for Beginner English Learners and the I Want to Learn English textbook. Please visit www.iwtle.com. In America's Second Civil War, a leader emerges that would unite the people and redefine the nation. Army General Asilas Roman led America out of the darkness of brother versus brother, sister versus sister, and neighbor versus neighbor, and into enormous prosperity unlike anything the world had ever seen before. The high cost of change in the country from lost in ambiguous character to unified and stoic populism was ultimately worth paying. For in the end of America's attempted suicide, it grew larger and more powerful than any empire before. America became the new kingdom of America. It ceased to be a democracy. Instead, it found wealth and expansion under a king. King Asylus. This is the story of his rise to the ultimate power. I wasn't born to be a king. I was born to a military family and grew up mostly in Florida, but we moved around to several states and even a few countries. I loved the army from the time I could love anything. My whole upbringing, I wanted to be a general in the army. I wanted to lead men into battle and be a warrior. I wanted to serve my country as a patriot and a soldier. I loved the United States and all I ever wanted to do was preserve the American way of life. But. Some very terrible things happened. There were great divisions among the people. 
It started with politics, Democrats versus Republicans, then conservatives versus liberals, and then the conversation went deeper to socialist versus capitalist, free market versus the federalization of private enterprise. Politics became so toxic, even family members were fighting, sometimes to the point of killing each other. It's like the whole country was gripped by a triggered madness or a virus, and people took to the streets to fight over frivolous things. To make matters more complicated, America was at war with phantoms, the so-called terrorist groups, and even some countries. It was like going into battle with shadows. We could never actually see or know if we were winning. But... Citizens didn't care about wars with other countries. They cared about opinions and wanted to destroy aspects of America by attempting to scrap the Constitution, the right to free speech, the right to bear arms, and the right to due process. America was being torn apart from within, from its own citizens. Most had no idea why they were so angry. But I sort of knew. I was aware of what the government was doing to its people. I was aware of corporations using social experiments to trigger the dormant virus in the American psyche. The poison put in foods over generations. The poison put in their minds through music and television shows. The poison put into education through indoctrinization of super self-importance and the dismissal of American pride and patriotism. I wasn't born to be America's king. But America faltered to the point it could no longer sustain its own self. The very aspects of democracy had ruined the essence of American pride, and the very notion of American pride became offensive to the ubiquitous of many. It became too difficult to be American around Americans in a self-loathing, relentless sloshing of what was politically correct and what was not. I never learned who the authorities were that deemed subtleties as offensive or politically incorrect, but something told me it originated from the pits of hell because nothing good ever came from it. I became king, reluctantly. But now, the country is much better for it. Thanks be to God. At the start of America's second civil war, the country was segmenting into five different parts. There were essentially five fronts and General Asilus was given the authority to negotiate with the leaders of the five separatist groups by the president. As it turned out, the president was rather weak and unsure of what to do. It was, after all, unprecedented that so many states wanted to secede from the Union and to become sovereign nations. But unlike Abraham Lincoln and how he dealt with the state trying to leave the Union, America's last president did not have the grit to face his political adversaries. Instead, he gave that responsibility to General Asilas Roman, a true patriot and a man he knew and trusted with the fate of the nation. The war was brutal and bloody. Two long years of battles resulted in millions of dead Americans, both as casualties of war and collateral damage. The five separatist groups underestimated General Silas and often 
overplayed their hand. They thought they could stretch the American military so thin they could take advantage of any fractures. But the U.S. military never wavered and General Silas played the mind games of his adversaries. In a gesture that appeared to show the U.S. military was willing to talk to the separatists in order to avoid the surrender, Silas asked to speak with the leaders of the separatists in the neutral zone. The leaders, at first, wanted to send representatives to negotiate terms with the general, but Silas insisted either all of the leaders met in one room or the fighting would continue. And nobody wanted more bloodshed. The years of war and loss had taken a bitter toll on everyone. So, reluctantly, the leaders agreed to meet in Toronto on Canadian soil. And at that meeting, General Silas had all of the leaders of the separatist groups assassinated. It was the beginning of the great undertaking. Senators and members of Congress from every state were arrested and were all assassinated one by one. It was the single most treacherous night of assassinations in any nation's history. General Silas declared martial law and all states were put on high alert. If anyone attempted to re-establish the separatist groups or attempt to re-engage the United States with paramilitary action, the president was prepared to launch nuclear bombs on everyone who dared. Without the head of separatists and the threat of nuclear bombs, the five separatist groups surrendered. General Silas Roman had done the impossible. He reunited the country. The war was finally over. There were many celebrations in the streets for days on end, but eventually, when the elation subsided, people began to wonder why General Asylas and not their president continued to talk to the people on television. There was chatter on the internet and many questioned whether the president was even in power anymore. Asylas wanted to address people's concerns and scheduled a televised and live stream press conference early in the day. I want all Americans to know the state of our union. While the Civil War happened because of the separatist state's intention of seceding from the United States of America, their efforts essentially created an instability of our country's government. But we all know our United States government was already in disarray, even before the war broke out. Our political system failed us in the end. Our three branches of government ultimately became so corrupt and self-serving that a civil war was inevitable. Things happened the way it did because our democratic system had run its course. Like food on the counter that spoils over time, so did our government. And for things to remain in order, I will continue to impose martial law until a new government is put into place. Therefore, the celebrations must stop. 
I will come back on television, radio, and the internet tomorrow to announce our new government. In the meantime, all networks will be running state-approved programs for your viewing pleasure. This evening, the president will speak to us all from the White House. I caution all Americans to limit the content they watch on the internet and TV. Do not believe any news reports that are not coming from the White House. I am here with the president, and tomorrow you will wake up in a whole new view of our beautiful country. God bless America. The people became uneasy about General Osiris' announcement. After his brief statement, the internet lit up with all sorts of conspiracies. The tension mounted as the president took to the airwaves that evening. In a somber tone, he spoke the most shattering words Americans had ever heard. The United States was to be no more. My fellow Americans, today our country will begin a completely new chapter in our existence. We have endured a bloody, costly civil war in which many of our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers have paid for with their lives. What they paid for was our salvation as a people and to right the ship that had run aground. Our country was splitting apart, literally at the seams and we made some hard choices. Some chose to save themselves and tried to break away from the union. And there were five separate groups that tried. We had to war with ourselves in order to bring everyone back together. But that isn't the whole story. We were a nation torn and divided long before the war. Our political system had become so corrupt so partisan that obstructionism became business as usual and we all suffered and choked because some people simply became too powerful. And to be frank, too many people held on to their power no matter how it hurt our country. And the politics meant to keep our nation honest was anything but. This led us ultimately to how we came to war with ourselves. Thank God for General Asilas. We thank God that he was here to lead us all through the bleakness of nearly two years of this nation's second civil war. General Asilas did not operate under a partisan agenda. He did not wish to defeat an enemy, nor was he motivated by monetary profit. Our country owes him immensely because there were moments it seemed like the opposition had the advantage. No one was sure what the outcome would be, except for General Asilas. He always assured us our nation would prevail. So tonight, I want all Americans to rally behind General Asilas, because come midnight tonight, America will be entering a new era. It will not be business as usual. It will not be like our old political system. We know that system is a complete failure. Effective midnight tonight, I will no longer be the president of the United States of America. At exactly 12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, our country will change to an absolute monarchy and General Asilas will become our nation's first king. We will now become the new kingdom of America with General Asilas as our king and our people will no longer have to suffer under the partisanship and corruption of our old political system. King Asilas will have the final say on how our government will function. 
he will right this ship and rid us of the leeches and oligarchy that ruined democracy. God bless the new kingdom of America and King Asilas. Good evening, America. The whole world is waiting for the transfer of power in Washington tonight. We are at the White House and are just moments away from General Asilas Roman being sworn in as America's first king. The swearing-in is said to take place in the Oval Office. We go live now to listen to General Asilas. I have to say, Asilas, looking at the paintings of our country's founders in the halls of the White House is very sobering. I can't imagine any of my predecessors sitting in this Oval Office and contemplating the end of democracy in the United States. Nor did I imagine the fate of the United States would come to this. So I echo that sentiment, Mr. President. I am curious, Asilas. Do you really think this whole thing happened by chance? What do you mean? You do remember all the oaths you took in defending our country, right? I do. And do you remember those, well, gatherings we had? Those nights when we had to dress up in robes and dance around a giant fire, chanting things in Latin. You remember those. <clears throat> Actually, I would rather forget those gatherings, as you say. This whole thing was planned, Asilas. Someone had an idea and scenarios were constructed, and this was one of the possible outcomes everyone could live with. You do understand this, I hope. I imagine I have no choice. I mean, look at the painting of George Washington on the wall. There was a man who was asked to be king. He would have been America's first king, but instead he declined. I guess democracy was his way to immortality. All of those guys back then, they must have been so proud to have designed this government. 
It was planned so perfectly. And yet, I can't help but look at his portrait and know in my heart we let them all down. Mr. President, we did not let them down. They let us down. They created and handed over a system that was bound to fail. And other presidents saw it, they knew it, and tried to warn us about it. But the monster just got bigger and more powerful. So powerful that they make men like us dress up in costumes and secret locations and chant stupidities in Latin. I find that whole mess ridiculous. Ridiculous or not, you will have to deal with them, the monster, now more than ever. And when they call, you will answer. When they tell you to act, you will act. That is my advice to you. Now, are you ready to hold this office? I do have to ask, just because I have to be the first one to ask. Will you turn the Oval Office into a throne room? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that would be appropriate. I love the tradition of this office too much to do something like that. The Oval Office will never be a throne room. I promise you that. Well, Asilas, three minutes left. I can hear movement out in the hallway. The justice holding that Bible will come in soon, along with all the witnesses, and you'll be sworn in as king. I hope you're ready for this because not only America, but the entire world will change with every action you take. Good luck to you, my friend. And should you ever need my counsel, I'll be here anytime you need me. Thank you, Mr. President. I will definitely need you. The country will need you. Okay, I'm ready. The country had now become the new kingdom of America, and from the very first day, things were very different. Some people were very excited about having a king, someone in complete control instead of the chaos of politics. Others were not pleased and took to the streets to protest, but that didn't last very long. People quickly learned Asylas had a heavy hand and dealt with dissidents harshly. And when the troublemakers were weeded out, prosperity began to be experienced by everyone. The number of poor people declined steadily, and the economy grew exponentially. King Asylas was soon being praised and celebrated. He was the man in charge, but a man whose past was haunting him. Very early into his reign, King Asylas was having trouble sleeping because of night terrors. He was so sure of everything he was doing as king. Changing the power structure to include the states more, dismantling many of the government agencies, and change the purpose and authority of the Supreme Court. His plans and the people he appointed to carry out the nation's restructuring was brilliant. It's just no one knew about his inner troubles. No one except his wife, Queen Rebecca, and his secret doctor, Dr. Ezekiel. Listening to The Rise of King of Silas, Episode 1, The Ascension, starring J.V. Torres as King of Silas, Clarence Jackson as the President, and narrated by Sergei Brezhnikov. Also in this episode, Meg McDonald and Don Radzinski. Music contributions include the song My Life's Work, performed by John Brazil, and Impossible Bottle by Signal to Noise. 
Other contributors include Audio Jungle and Freesound.org. For more information about this production, please visit our website at www.theriseofkingasilas.com and subscribe to this podcast. This production is copyrighted 2017 by the J.V. Micah Publishing Company in Baltimore, Maryland and the New Kingdom Radio Theater. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening and make sure to tune in for episode two. Fighting alongside someone can form an unbreakable bond. However, when a bond is unbreakable, what happens if there comes a time when you really want to break it? In our second tale, we find two soldiers in the middle of the Chadvian War who have made a promise to each other that is stronger than any army. This is your second story. up on the fifth floor of an office building in the center of town. We're surrounded by enemy fire. Reinforcements are needed immediately. Do you copy? Over. Roger that, Private Caldwell. Reinforcements are on their way. Sit tight and hold your position until we arrive. Over. I hope they get here soon. I don't know how much longer we can hold them off. Boy, were they wrong about this place. Whoever thought Chatvia was going to welcome us with open arms was dead wrong. They're closing in on us. I'm almost out of ammo. Me too. James, I know this looks bad, but you and I have been through way worse in this war, and I've always gotten out of it. Worse than this? I don't think so. If we stick together, we'll make it out, and we will both get home to our families. And if things do go bad for one of us, don't forget about the code we swore to. Ah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, the code. You remember the code, right? Well, y- yes, of course. The, the code. Uh, I remember it. Yes, yes, the, the code. Now, if you cover me, I think I can make it to the other side of this room and then get a clear shot of that sniper in the building across from us. Are you crazy, Luke? You're gonna get killed! This is our only hope to hold off these chat fiends until reinforcements show up. If I can take that sniper out, we've got a chance. Also, if something does happen to me, I feel better knowing that you remember the code. Yes, I, I told you, I remember the code. I, I, I understand it and remember it. The code has always been the last thing I think of when I go to bed, and the first thing I think of when I wake up. I only dream of the code. That doesn't mean you should risk your life like this. All I need is the strength knowing that the code is everything to you. As soon as I move, start shooting. I don't like this. I'm going on the count of three. Don't do it, Luke. One. Oh, God. Two. What are you thinking? Three. Shoot now. Ah! I'm hit. Luke! No! Are you okay? I... I can't tell. Let me see it. Well? Is it bad? Honestly, it's a a massive hole in your chest. Oh, God. This is as big as a hole can get. It... It somehow feels like the hole is bigger than your chest, if that's at all possible. It's not. Look, we can wait this out. We've got reinforcements on the way. We we just have to hold out a little while longer, and then we can get you back to base. James, we both know how this ends. Don't talk like that. This ends how I say it ends. With you going home alive. Don't be stupid. Look, I haven't got much time before. I said don't talk like that. Wake up, James. I've got a hole in my chest that, according to you, is unlike any hole ever seen before. 
I can't see me pulling through this. That was just the shock of seeing a hole like that up close. I, the, the, the more I look at it now, the the more it looks like a, a regular bullet hole. I, I might be able to get a few fingers in there, but, but probably not my entire fist. James, listen closely. Yes, Luke. The code. The what? The promise we made. We just talked about it. It's a code, is it? Yes. Right. Code, of course. Yeah, I remember. It's in my front pocket. Okay. We made a promise that if one of us were to die out here, the other will perform every item on the list they made. Once they get back home. Yeah, I, I see it here. It's a, an actual list. Wow. You know I can trust you. And now I can die. Knowing everything on that list will be taken care of. Pretty long list here. I I haven't got much time. Can't we walk through a few of the items on the list so I can add a bit of clarification on some of them? Uh, Luke, I will figure it out. Don't worry. Just focus on staying alive with me. No. I'm almost gone. Please. I will feel better knowing that you have looked through the list and are fully aware of everything that needs to be done. I would just feel better if we did this now, please. This is how you want to spend your final minutes? Going through your list? Yes, please. Start at the top. Uh, of course. Uh, uh, j- just let me check on the reinforcements here. This is Private James Gallows checking in for an update on reinforcements called in earlier by Private Coldwell. Over. Roger that, Private Gallows. Reinforcements are on route and should arrive at 0800 hours. Over. 0800 hours? That's still 15 minutes from now. I- I've got a wounded soldier here. Over. We are moving as fast as we can, Private. Hang tight. Over. Roger that. James, the list. Please. Yes, the list. Okay. The code that we agreed to was that every item on the list had to be done. I remember that, but I didn't think you'd have something this long. My list only has two things on it. Everything I wrote on that list is equally as important. To be honest, Luke, at a quick glance, I saw something about cleaning the gutters at your sister's house. She's a single mother and doesn't have anyone in her life that is helpful around the house. Can we start at the top of the list, please? Stop reading ahead. I'm starting to fade. Okay, yes, right. From the top. Here we go. Number one. Tell my parents that I love them. My parents and I had a falling out before I left for Chafia. I didn't get a chance to clear the air with them. You must tell them I love them. Okay, uh, I can do that. It's not a big deal. I'm sure they already know that you love them, but if, if you need me to reiterate it, I'll do that. Thank you. You're such a good friend. My father can be stubborn, and my mother, well, her heart is in the right place, but... Right, okay. Number two. Read a bedtime story to my children. Yes, my two children, Sarah and Riley. I always loved it when I read them a bedtime story. This will give them one last story from their father. Um, would it? What do you mean? Well, I'm not their father. No, but you would be representing me. It would be like it was coming from me. It would mean so much to them. I think it would freak them out. Some stranger reading them a bedtime story pretending to be their father just after they find out their father is dead? Then wait a few weeks before you do it. (laughs) No, no. I can see me getting this one out of the way as soon as possible. Let's move on to the next one. I still feel like you're going to make it through, Luke. I really do. Number three. Read it. Tell my wife I am cheating on her. Not a chance in hell that one is happening. You have to. I can't die without telling her the truth. You are out of your mind. I've never even met your wife. I've been seeing a woman named Rita for the past four years of our marriage. I am not doing it. But the code, you promised. I was wondering why you kept bringing up this whole code thing all the time. I'd never even heard of it. You kept saying that it was a thing all soldiers did and that we had to do it too. I'm the one dying here, not you. Just tell her and then run. Tell her and then run. Oh, I am loving the new Luke here. Where were you the whole time? James, I'm almost... Let's keep scrolling down the list, shall we? Number four. Tell Rita I love her. Number five. 
tell Rita I've been married this whole time. Number six. Oh, uh, this is your sister's gutters. We've already covered that. James. Number seven. Paint my house. Don't worry. I already have the colors picked out. We gravel the driveway. I wanted to do that myself, but before I left for Chatvia... Tell my brother he still owes me $400. He does. I lent him that money when he was going through a divorce, and he never paid me back. How do you expect me to do all of this? You can never break the code, no matter what. This list is just filled with the things you either forgot to do or are too afraid to do. Give me the list. Why? Are you, you taking it from me? No. I forgot to add in. Tell my co-worker Fred Jameson that I'm sleeping with his wife Rita. I'm surprised none of Rita's yard work is on here. Should I add that? Listen, I'm not going to sit here and watch you die like this. A good man like you deserves to live to an old age. What are you doing? I am saving your life. Don't touch me. I'm taking that bullet out, and I'm going to close that hole. No, let me die. No, I'm going to save your life, because I'm a hero, goddammit. Uh, uh, no, you follow your instincts and watch me die without doing anything. I'm going to use my knife to dig the bullet out. This is gonna hurt. No, don't touch me. Someone help me. He's trying to save my life. Uh, uh, no! Uh, I've got the bullet! No! Hold still! I'm going to cauterize the wound. Uh, Hold still so I can burn you! James, I... Private James Gallows, are you there? Over. Yes, I'm here. Over. Reinforcements are just arriving. There is a vehicle to take any wounded back to base. Over. Yes, just on time. Thank you. Over. They're here. Looks like you're going to live after all. James. Get on your feet. I am taking you to that truck. James. You are going back to the base and receive the medical treatment that you need. James. What? Good luck with the list. Uh... Luke. No, Luke. (laughs) Luke, come back to me, Luke. They're here. Luke. You don't... Please. We can save you now, Luke. Luke. (laughs) And then the beautiful princess and the handsome prince fell in love and lived happily ever after. The end. They're fast asleep. I can't thank you enough for this. They really do miss their father. This really helped. No problem. Well, it's late. I better get going. Well, stop by any time. The kids always love a good bedtime story. Sure thing. Anyway, Luke was cheating on you for years with a woman named Rita. I have to go now. Bye. What? Gonna grab some paint at the hardware store so I can get started on the house tomorrow afternoon. See ya! <laughs> Coming home from war isn't always easy. Sometimes, a different battle is waiting for you when you get back. However, if... Oh, uh, sorry. I was just coming down to record my outro. I thought you were finished. Baron, can you give me a minute? Why don't you drop the attitude? It was just a mistake. Sorry. I won't be long. I'm just at the end. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll just wait here. I prefer to record alone. Okay, okay. I'll come back, I guess. What a jerk. Oh. Ah, I'm too frustrated. I'm going right to the tagline. This was your second story. Are you done? Go ahead. Okay. 
Thank you, everyone, for listening to Your Three Stories. I would like to thank our voice actors in this episode, Franklin McGibbon and Daniel Farrow. I would also like to thank our special guest voice actor, Jennifer, from the podcast Haunted Happenstance, as Luke's wife at the end. Haunted Happenstance is a truly spooky series of ghost stories set in Boston. You can find Jennifer's show anywhere you normally get your podcasts. If you listen to your three stories on Apple Podcasts, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a nice rating and review. It really helps the show grow. And if you want to keep up to date with your three stories, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I would now like to leave you with a message from a podcast called I Said God Damn. Hey, true crime listeners, check out our podcast, I Said God Damn. We're a true crime comedy podcast hosted by two besties who like to share messed up cases that make you say God damn. Every Sunday, we try to one-up each other's story by sharing a horrific case the other has never heard of. Along the way, we splash in some wildly inappropriate jokes and colorful language. Listen every Sunday from any of your favorite podcast directories. Also, follow us on Twitter at ISGD Podcast or visit our website, isgdpodcast.com. And that's this week's show. Be sure to check out both The Rise of King Asylus and your three stories in this week's show notes. And send us a note this holiday season at sonicsociety at gmail.com or tweet at us at Sonic Society or at AstroTour 2010. You can also find us on the Sonic Society or Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers Facebook groups. And until next week here on Sunday Showcase, right here on the Mutual Audio Network, I'm David Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Have a great morning, everyone. Yep, have a lovely day. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Buongiorno. I am Flaudio, and I am very interested in what makes audio drama work. I want to share with you my recipe for a perfect evening. An evening for two lovers. Lovers of audio drama. When I plan an audio drama, I want to make sure that everything is perfect for us. The soundscape is the most important thing to set the mood for the night. When I lay in a special ambiance or sound effect, It is very important because it can express what I feel so perfectly. A sound effect can speak for the story when words just cannot capture the love I feel. Love I feel for you. When it is dark, I turn on the sound effects. I turn up the soundscape. And the voices can then dance in a perfect state of bliss where there is no world except the one we make with our love. No time except what is needed for our story to play out. A story that we will make come true.
This audio drama public service announcement was brought to you by the Amigos.